Okay, so Juliet Olshock is the uh, Sustainable Land Care Program Manager, or excuse me, Coordinator at Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Gardens. She is a former classroom teacher and small landscape business owner. Her work with Phipps combines these two experiences as she organizes educational opportunities for local land care professionals and home gardeners focusing on sustainable land care principles and practices. Julia enjoys growing a variety of plants, learning about local wildlife, and creating a backyard oasis at her home in Hazelwood. Thanks, Juliet. Thanks, Annie, and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, food forest is one of my favorite topics, so I'm excited um, to have this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. And uh, I'm just going to arrange some things here so that nothing's in my way. All right. Um, so as, as Annie mentioned, um, my name is Juliet Olshock. I'm the Sustainable Land Care Program Coordinator at Phipps Conservatory. And I just wanted to you know, very briefly kind of introduce what I do um, in that position. Uh, one of our biggest projects is the Sustainable Land Care Accreditation Training. Uh, so this is a training that we offer every year for local landscape professionals, um, as well as a lot of um, a lot of our environmental nonprofits, um, such as Grow Pittsburgh, uh, Tree Pittsburgh, um, Grounded. I mean, we have a lot of um, you know within within the city of Pittsburgh, a lot of organizations that help support um, you know our 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 plants and 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 growing. So they they've also attended this training um, as a part of this training. Um, local professionals become accredited, and then we we help to sort of promote their work as um, sustainable providers. So these are people that have pledged, you know, they they are not um, going to rely on synthetic, you know, pesticides and fertilizers. They will use organic uh, methods and really use best practices to take care of, um, you know, local properties. Um, so that's a, a big program that I'm involved with. I also, you know, as a part of that, um, you know, I do do education for um, local uh, homeowners and home gardeners as well. Um, two, two more projects just to highlight. We started um, in 2020 the FIP Sustainable Garden Awards, and this is an awards program to, to really highlight um, our gardeners, you know, local residential gardeners who have really beautiful gardens um, you know, and manage them organically. So, um, you know, for the past two years, we've been able to, to share some really great examples and we um, continue to grow that program. Um, and one last um, program to share is the top 10 sustainable plants. Um, this is a program where our horticulture staff have, have suggested plants that are just really hardy to this area um, you know, they do well, they don't need a lot of extra, you know, tender babying and care, and they won't spread and take over. Um, the sustainable, uh, these top 10 sustainable plants are now available online. And so we have a searchable uh, web page where you can kind of go to and you can search for plants um, according to the conditions of your yard and, um, you know, what specific plants you're looking for. So this is a, a great um, program that we have as well. Um, before working at Phipps, I was involved in a project uh, with a friend of mine and we planted a food forest in Hazelwood. Uh, that's the neighborhood that I live in now and I, I lived in at the time. Uh, we, we transformed a quarter acre vacant lot into a food forest and uh, managed that for, for about five years on that property. Um, so from, you know, from that experience, I really learned a lot, um, you know, and since then have, have a lot more, you know, that I want to share with you tonight. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to kind of share that that was sort of my first experience. This was in 20, uh, 2010, um, you know, planting and, and developing a food forest. Our agenda for tonight is I wanna share some historical context for food forests, um, as well as some contemporary examples. 
I will uh, share a definition and um, focus on some elements and functions of food forest plants. So I, I'll give you some plant uh, suggestions, some plant examples, and then a whole bunch of resources uh, so you can continue to, to learn more. Uh, one thing I think it's important to share is that food forests are indigenous. Um, there's you know, evidence that, that food forests or these sort of perennial food systems uh, you know, are an, an indigenous way of, of growing food and have been used sort of um, by native peoples uh, like around the globe, you know, and so there, there's a lot of evidence in uh, the tropical areas and, you know, I have some examples from sort of tropical food forests, uh, but we also, you know, um, have found that, um, you know, these perennial food systems you know, existed across um, the United States and other sort of non-tropical uh, areas. Uh, one, one that I want to share here um, is a food forest in Morocco. Uh, this food forest is said to be one of the oldest um, examples of a perennial food system, you know, with, with evidence of it, it you know, being there for um, over centuries, you know, just um, having this, this structure of all of these, uh, you know, beneficial food plants growing very close together and being managed uh, by the, the native peoples. Um, this uh, specific food forest was in a, in a location that um, kind of helped to popularize our understanding of food forests um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jeff Lawton, um, but Jeff Lawton, you know, visited this, this, um, you know, this food system in the 1970s and was really, um, you know, very taken by the amount of food that was produced in a small space and just the, um, you know, the system that was there, especially during a time when, um, you know, we, we really had more of these, um, you know, vast kind of uh, commercial uh, monoculture cropping conditions that, that were, you know, growing and becoming very popular. Um, you know, he was excited to see this, this example of, um, you know, a more sustainable way to grow food. Uh, just to name some of the, the plants that are, that are here, um, they have date palms, uh, bananas, tamarinds, uh, oranges, figs, guava, pomegranates, lemons, limes, mulberries, grapes, um, other fruits and nuts, you know, growing in, in this space. Um, so it was just a really great example of, um, you know, perennial food production. And, and as I said, you know, there, there, there's examples of, of food forests or perennial agriculture um, in, in lots of you know, tropical areas. This is another one um, in the Amazon. Uh, but I wanted to kind of highlight, uh, you know, a, a food forest closer, a little bit closer to home. Um, this is an ancestral village site in northwestern British Columbia uh, that has a, a mix of species beneficial to humans um, and has been managed for over 150 years. Um, in this food forest, they have hazelnut, uh, crab apple, cranberries, and hawthorn, um, you know, and so I guess I wanted to say, in addition to this, I don't have a picture, um, but you know, there there's evidence of food forests in Kentucky, um, you know, ancient ancient food forests where they had uh, black walnuts, hickory nuts, chestnuts, and oaks. Uh, a friend of mine uh, has a, a book that describes a forest garden in. Um, Oh, French Creek, uh, the French Creek, which is, you know, north of here, sort of towards um, uh, the Butler area, or maybe even north of Butler. Um, but in that, in that, you know, um, indigenous food forest, they were growing um, hazelnuts and blueberries, you know, in, in managing the forest um, for food. So really what we, what we are doing when we're creating food forests is we're trying to mimic um, these systems. And, and one person who was doing that, um, this is an example in Japan, uh, Masanobu Fukuoku, um, who, who wrote some really great books, including uh, One Straw Revolution. And I'll um, highlight another one of his books later, 
um, he, he sort of developed a technique that he called natural gardening. And so this is a food forest that, that he grows. Um, he had grown, um, sorry, he's since passed, but he had grown in Japan. Um, this is a food forest that I planted in Highland Park. So this is in, the, the, um, in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh. Um, one thing to kind of highlight is, you know, food forests are um, a collection of plants. You know, it's plants that are supporting other plants, um, you know, so not all of what you're growing is sort of food crops. You know, there, there's a good variety in what you're growing. You're creating a, a balanced ecosystem. In here, this, the larger kind of tree to the background, this is persimmon. Um, and then you have some herbs that are flowering, attracting beneficial insects and really supporting the growth of that fruit tree. Um, this is an example in Point Breeze, another neighborhood in Pittsburgh. A friend of mine planted this one. Um, so this is this is very young. This was a picture taken probably pretty close after it was planted. Um, you'll see some fruit trees here, and then um, you know the understory or supporting plants around it. So to define a food forest, uh, it's a perennial food production that mimics a forest ecosystem. Uh, it's a community of plants to optimize the space, nutrient exchange, productivity, and biodiversity. Um, the benefits of food forests, you know, they, they can be a source of home and community food production, habitat for wildlife and biodiversity, and can help to um, encourage or improve the awareness of seasonal fruits and vegetables um, and nuts. So food forests are ecosystems. So we talked about um, how it's sort of a collection of plants. Um, they are plants that, that support each other, that also support wildlife. Um, so I think it's very important that we, when creating food forests, we focus on native plants. Um, there are a lot of native edibles, you know, and so starting with uh, what is native to, to um, you know, Western Pennsylvania, what is native to the place that I'm growing, um, and kind of build off of that. So you, you should, um, I think a, a goal to strive for would be to have 40 to 75% uh, of your food forest be native plants. You know, they're adapted to the local soil and climate conditions. Um, so they, they require less inputs. Um, they also are important to provide wildlife and support for pollinators. Um, so, you know, when I say that the, the food forest is an ecosystem, um, you know, it's, it, you know, we're really planting it or creating it to provide food for ourselves. Uh, but at the same time, in order for it to be sustainable, it should also be supporting uh, the larger ecosystem. So it should be supporting our native birds and our native wildlife. Um, this slide is just to highlight um, the difficulty of growing uh, certain plants, a lot of, um, you know, European uh, fruits, you know, we've brought in like apples and pears really have a lot of um, pest pressure. And so, you know, not only do we want to focus on natives to avoid that, um, but, you know, think about, you know, if I really want to grow, say, apples and pears um, specifically, um, or even, you know, peaches have a lot of pest pressure. Um, these two books by Michael Phillips are really fantastic resources uh, for learning how to support and, and grow organic fruit so that we're not having um, you know, to rely on pesticides. And again, if we're creating um, you know, a sustainable ecosystem, we don't wanna be putting um, you know, uh, synthetic chemicals out there that, that could be killing our beneficial um, insects and wildlife. All right. Uh, so having said that, I want to focus on some, some other, uh, I guess, um, aspects of a food forest. So we're mimicking a natural forest and, um, you know, forests are, you know, have this sort of uh, layers, you know, they have a layer of plants. Um, you know, if you walked out to a, um, you know, sort of a, a, a natural forest or forest area, you'll see examples of these different layers. So that you'll have shorter trees that are, you know, that are doing uh, well with, with some shade. Uh, below that you'll have shrubs. 
um, an herbaceous layer, as well as plants that are growing, you know, pretty close, like hugging the surface. Um, you'll have plants that have some edible parts within the root zone. Um, so that's important, as well as vines. So these are, um, you know, layers of a forest that, again, we want to make in our food choosing plants that, that kind of fill all of these different layers, um, you know, and so you can focus on, um, you know, fruits and nuts that fit into these layer layers, um, other useful shrubs. I'll, I'll talk about other, other useful plants other than those that are edible. Um, you know, our herbaceous layer, it's very important to have flowers, um, herbs, you can include some vegetables. And then, you know, you get down into your, um, your root layer where you may be growing mushrooms, um, again, having root vegetables, and then thinking about some vining plants as well. So this is just sort of an example here to kind of show you now this, this isn't showing, um, you know, a canopy, but you've got some shorter trees here, you may have some shrubs, herbs, um, you know, plants growing very closely to the ground. Um, but you'll have sort of this collection of plants. Um, these are just some more examples. Um, this one here is, is easier to kind of interpret. You can see the, the fruit trees here it looks like multiple, um, you know, different types of fruit trees. Uh, you have, you know, th this is, uh, looks like a mullein, you know, kind of growing out here. The, the herb layer looks like you have some shrubs in the background. Um, some, you're, you're growing a lot of food in, in a kind of a tight space here and in multiple um, different layers. Uh, one more example here, this is just showing how you could, you know, have, have sort of, sort of your, your forested or, um, you know, your, your food forest area. And then at some point you might want to have your vegetables, especially those that need a lot of sunlight. Um, you may want to have like a separate, you know, area for them. All right, so if we're creating an ecosystem, um, we have plants that are working together and supporting other plants. And so I wanna talk to you about some of these different types of plants. Um, we can call these plant functions or um, you know, ecosystem functions, uh, but one aspect is uh, providing for soil fertility. Um, and this is done through the use of nitrogen fixers. A uh, second way that plants can support other plants is by attracting beneficial insects. Um, some of our plants will be important ground covers. And then of course we have our crops, um, you know, which we're specifically growing uh, for food. This here is an image uh, from the Hazelwood Food Forest. And you know, this is a peach tree here. We have another um, fruit tree in the background. But then in the foreground, um, this is one of our plants that we're growing uh, specifically to, to attract beneficial insects. And you can see uh, a monarch butterfly on that. All right, so starting with nitrogen fixers, these are plants that have a relationship with bacteria in the soil um, in that the plant itself is sort of feeding this bacteria um, carbon and sugars and in exchange, um, the bacteria is able to um, change the nitrogen that's that in the soil, you know, in the air, um, into a form that plants can readily use. Um, so it's it's changing the nitrogen in a way that it can feed plants and it can feed these plants um, useful nitrogen. Um, so these are plants uh, that, that you know, have this relationship. We call them nitrogen fixers. The plants themselves will be higher in nitrogen uh, than other plants. Um, and the soil around these plants will have more um, nitrogen in it. So it's, it's really helping to, um, you know, to, to, to feed the plants that they're in association with. Uh, you know, uh, earlier I was talking about the different layers. You can find nitrogen fixers in all of those different forest layers. So there are trees, um, shrubs, herbs, ground covers, um, all that fix nitrogen. So I'm sharing a few examples 
Um, if you were in, if you were signed on earlier, you heard us talking about Baptisia or the wild blue indigo. It's just a gorgeous, really beautiful plant um, that's you know adding nitrogen to the soil. Uh, wild lupin is another really beautiful uh, perennial plant. So both of these are on the herb layer. Um, these other three are uh, shrubs. These are native shrubs that, that fix nitrogen. So we have wild senna, um, which I would be careful with. Wild senna can get a little bit crazy. So, um, you know, just, just think about that. Uh, New Jersey tea has a, you know, it can be used as a tea substitute. The, the leaves are a good tea substitute, attracts a lot of beneficial insects and is fixing nitrogen. And this, this false indigo bush, um, it sort of looks like a low tree, um, but it has these beautiful, you can't really tell from the picture, but it has these beautiful sort of purple, um, orangish yellow flowers, it attracts a ton of beneficial insects and really is, um, you know, by the size of it, is really fixing a lot of nitrogen. Um, what you can do with these plants, um, you know, some of them, you know, like the Baptisia, I wouldn't ever, I wouldn't cut down, but say like the wild senna, um, you can do what's called chop and drop. So you, you cut that plant back and you can, um, before it goes to seed, um, you can mulch with it. And again, that's just, that's just spreading that, um, that the, the plant matter that's high in nitrogen. It's really helping to, um, provide fertility for your soil. So that's really the benefit of these plants. Um, I had mentioned, um, you know, beneficial insects. And before I talk about plants that attract beneficial insects, I just wanted to mention a few of these uh, beneficials, just so you understand what I'm, what I mean. Um, the first here is this um, fly. It's a surfid fly. It has a few different common names, a hoverfly, flower fly. It looks like a bee. You can see the coloring here. This is not a bee. Um, actually, if you look at the wings here, you can really see it looks it, in the eyes here. It looks like a fly. Um, it's attracted to um, flowers, you know, and it, it feeds on the um, pollen and nectar of flowers. It, it is actually very important for pollination. So bees are our number one insects for pollinating. Um, you know, and if you think about we're growing uh, food crops, so pollination is very important in um, fruit set. Uh, bee, sorry, flies are uh, the second most important insect to bees. So they, they do a great job in also helping to pollinate our plants. Um, and another bonus, you can see down here, this is the surfid fly larva. Um, so the young of the surfid fly is actually what our benefit is, is our beneficial insect and it um, just eats tons and tons of aphids. Um, so you can see here, this is, you know, really kind of enhanced picture here. So you could see it clearly. Um, so they, they, they feed on soft bodied insects um, that would potentially really impact um, your forest garden. So that's a, a great friend to encourage. Another one here is the green lacewing. And you can see this is, again, is the adult um, attracted to flowers, you know, so they're feeding on the pollen and nectar. And then they, they, um, their young feeds on, again, these aphids and uh, soft bodied insects. So this is, this again, this is, this was a picture I took uh, with my camera and kind of blew up. That's why it's not as, um, you know, it's, it's not as good of a picture, uh, but you can kind of see here the way that it looks and the, the white spots here that help help to identify that. Um, you know, we all know that ladybugs are, are good to have. Um, you might not know the reason why. Um, ladybugs themselves eat a lot of insects, uh, but their larva actually does a, a really great job in um, suppressing aphids, especially. Um, and other other small soft insects like that. Uh, one last uh, beneficial that I want to talk about is a braconid wasp. So this is the adult. So it's a very small uh, wasp that lays its eggs and sort of creates these, these little cocoons. Um, and the young here is feeding on, this is a large caterpillar, if you're familiar with the, um, the hornworm 
caterpillar. That's what this is feeding on. Um, so these become our pest control. Okay, so we're not spraying um, to you know manage for pests. We're encouraging a healthy ecosystem, and we're encouraging these beneficial insects to do that job for us. Um, so we can plant, again, we can plant in all those different layers. We can have trees that are attracting beneficials, uh, shrubs, herbs, ground cover, and, um, you know, really all across those layers fulfilling this niche to attract beneficials. Um, I have some examples here um, that, that you can see. I won't go into a lot of detail, um, just, I guess, to encourage you know, uh, planting in different layers, but also focusing on, um, you know, attracting beneficials. So again, the, this is our natural pest control. Uh, one more thing I want to say as far as planting for our beneficials is that um, native plants in the aster family or the asteraceae family um, are, are said to be one of the, the most important plants for supporting our native bees. Um, so that would be something, again, I would be looking for, you know, if I was planting my food forest, I want to make sure to include uh, plants from the aster family. Um, so these, of course, um, asters are in that family. Uh, fleabane is another example. Uh, sunflowers as well. But they're the ones that have this uh, disc and ray flower, you know, so it has the center spot um, and the petals um, surrounding it. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. All right, um, moving on, um, you know, one of the other functions is we want to make sure that we have plants that are helping to cover the ground. Um, this is important because any bare area of soil, uh, Mother Nature will plant something for us, and it may not be something that we want. Um, you know, so as we're planting our food forest, thinking about making sure not only we have the, the vertical layers covered, but sort of horizontally or you know, across the property, um, we wanna make sure the ground is covered and um, that plants are doing that for us. Um, this is just an example of um, you know, what it could look like if you have a, a, diverse, um, a diversity of ground covers and just how beautiful that is. And you can really see there's not a lot of space um, you know, for other plants um, to kind of push through and, and grow into here. Um, so again, focusing on um, this idea that we can have plants doing multiple things for us in multiple areas. Um, I have two um, ground cover nitrogen fixers. So I have partridge pea and crimson clover. Um, both of those are annuals, but I felt like it was important to share um, because you could plant both of these as you're establishing your forest garden um, and, and, you know, spread some seed and really grow these the first year that, that's helping um, to improve the nitrogen. It's, you know, covering the area while other, you know, your crops are growing and, um, you know, they'll, they'll die back, but they're also just, you know, they're really pretty. They, they both attract beneficial insects as well. So they're doing a lot of good work for you. Um, other native ground covers that I really like, I love wild strawberry, uh, spreads really wonderfully, has an edible berry, uh, green and gold just looks really, you know, really beautiful. Same with uh, creeping phlox and, um, you know, both are going to cover the ground for you, attract beneficial insects um, and are native. So they're doing a lot of great work. This is your weed control. So instead of, you know, um, thinking about, you know, uh, I don't know, annual agricultural systems where you're spraying or um, cultivating uh, to control the weeds, we have plants that are doing that for us. All right, so um, next here, I just wanna go through some of those different layers and uh, suggest some native plants uh, that you could use for those different layers. So starting with the tree layer and up here. So this symbol, that's a clover, and that's just indicating that these plants fix nitrogen. Um, 
I included this this little guy here. I believe that was a hover fly, um, you know, little icon that I found that um, I'm using to indicate that these are plants that attract beneficial insects. Um, this is a persimmon, so that's a native fruit, um, and showing that these are trees that produce um, fruit, you know, or or an edible part. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of natives that, that will fit this category. Um, two that I'm highlighting are um, pawpaw, which is a native fruit, has sort of a very sort of kind of tropical taste to it. Um, and hazelnut is just a really great nut, um, you know, that you can grow. They don't, uh, some of the nut trees can get quite large. Um, hazelnuts are uh, sort of a small tree, uh, large shrub, you know, so they're in that, that area. All right, moving to our shrub layer. I have, uh, again, some examples. Um, indigo bush, I had talked about New Jersey tea. Those are both great shrubs that uh, fix nitrogen and support beneficial insects. Again, we have a ton of native, um, you know, fruit shrubs. So, some, some of these you might not be as um, familiar with as far as eating. Um, these are currants here. Currants aren't like, they're not like super tasty. You wouldn't uh, pick them off of the, the plant, uh, but they make very uh, delicious, uh, you know, like jams and jellies and are also very nutritious. They're very high in antioxidants, um, vitamin A, vitamin C. So they're very, um, you know, they're really good and healthy for us. Um, elderberries, I had, I think I had mentioned before, they're one of my most favorite uh, fruits to grow. They're sort of this large shrub and I have a picture later, uh, but they're very prolific. So they create a ton of berries. Again, um, they're a little bit sour. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just eat this right off the, the bush, um, but they produce a ton of berries that my grandfather loved, um, elderberry pie. Um, you know, so you'd, you'd want to process this and create, create something yummy with it. Um, but, you know, blackberries, raspberries are all native, uh, blueberries, cranberries. So there's some great options here um, for edible fruits in the shrub layer. Um, and then I included some other shrubs that, you know, are important for our beneficials, um, but may not have edible. Well, hollies, um, hollies will have edible berries, uh, which attract our birds. And I think I included that because, um, again, we want to think about, you know, birds can help um, to really help the pest control as well. All right. Um, herbaceous plants. Again, I want to give you a good layer. Uh, we have a ton here, starting with our um, nitrogen fixing plants, also attracting beneficial insects. Uh, I've highlighted some edibles here. Stinging nettles is a really wonderful green. Um, you want to cook it and that, that will, um, you know, kind of kill the, the little, um, you know, the little stickers that it has. Um, so be careful in harvesting it, but it's, it's also just very nutritious. It's a great um, edible herb. Uh, ramps, uh, violets, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the leaves and, you know, sunflowers if you save those seeds. Um, but then again, just, just having um, some really beautiful plants here for yourself to enjoy that are also, um, you know, attracting these beneficials and being your pest control. All right, moving into some of those other layers, um, you know, further down, I had mentioned some ground covers. These are all the same, the same ground covers um, that I had mentioned in the root zone. Uh, two important ones I wanted to highlight. Um, again, these are native plants here that have an edible um, tuber. So the ground nut um, is called Apios americana, uh, is also a nitrogen fixer. So again, this plant is, is doing a lot of great work for us. Fixing nitrogen has some edible tubers, um, you know, would be great to include. Uh, sunchoke is also called Jerusalem artichoke. 
Uh, these are in the sunflower family. You can see here, this is actually a picture of the sunchokes. They get very tall. So mine grow, really measured them. I, I wanna say they're like, mm, I don't know. They could be up to 20 feet tall. Like they're very tall. It, it might only be 12 or 15 feet, but they get very tall. Um, the, the birds love to eat the seeds. So once this flower goes to seed, you'll see finches and other birds. Um, and it has this edible tuber that you can, you can dig up um, after, you know, after the plant sort of dies back. And then I wanted to feature this really wonderful native vine, um, which does all of the things. So this beautiful vine um, fixes nitrogen, has an edible bean, you know, that you can harvest and um, attracts beneficial insects. A lot of butterflies really love this plant, um, hummingbirds as well. So this is a really lovely one to include in your garden. Um, I wanted to just give another shout out to our native bees. Uh, we have over 400 native bees in Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, some of them aren't, you know, their populations aren't doing very well. So it's, it's good to support them and plant for them. Um, the plants that I've included here are not all native plants. So I want to say up to this point, I've, I've really focused on highlighting native plants for us. Um, but this, this slide, I just wanted to show sort of the great variety of um, plants that, that are also, you know, even though they're not native, they are supporting our native bees. Um, you know, so these are things you can plant. I wanted to highlight sort of these down here. So there are some vegetables. And actually, as you've seen, you know, there are native bees. Um, you know, squash has been grown. Uh, and squash family plants have been grown in the United States, um, you know, by indigenous people for many years. Um, you know, so there, there are some native varieties there. Um, there are lots of herbs. And again, even though a lot of these come from, um, you know, Europe and other countries, um, they can also still be very, very beneficial. They are also great ground cover. So I did want to highlight that. Um, I use oregano, um, uh, Sage, I don't, I guess sage wasn't on here. Uh, thyme, I should have included. All of those are really fantastic ground covers and, um, you know, have an herb that you can grow for your, for your cooking and include with your edible um, plants there. And again, all of these fruits are native. Um, so they're, they're doing well to, to support our native bees. All right, lastly, um, I wanted to just highlight here that food forests are managed ecosystems. So they're ecosystems, but um, we are a part of them, you know, and so we're, we're in, you know, we have an important job um, to manage them. And I wanted to end with sharing some images from the Hazelwood Food Forest. Um, this, this one, I thought it kind of looks a little bit crazy here, but it is highlighting the different layers, the different plants, you know, we don't just have all edible plants, we have some flowers and other things included as well. Um, this is just a beautiful peach tree that I loved um, right here, kind of highlighting the, the food forest sign that is also covered in uh, grapevine. Um, this is just another view of that peach tree with some supporting, you know, ground cover plants here. I believe this was a meadow rue. Um, this is a, um, this is chives, um, really nice plant to include. This is the peach tree when it, um, you know, was producing. And, you know, this slide is sort of warm. They do produce a ton of fruit. You know, this was one tree, massive amounts of fruit. So, so really be prepared for that and be able to um, use that or um, distribute. These are, this is uh, actually, the, I think it's the same pair, just different shots, but I wanted to include this to kind of show, again, we have a collection of plants. Not all of these are edible, but they are supporting the pear tree. Um, this was an Asian pear, and you can see, again, just, just a ton of fruit that was developed. Here's sort of another closer picture. Uh, these are the elderberries. So you can see how, how big they get. Ton of beautiful flowers attracting lots of insects um, and, you know, supplying just tons and tons. Every one of these flowers creates these, these big um, 
these big groupings of fruit. It's very medicinal. You can make a medicine. Um, I, you may have seen a lot of elderberry syrups and things. Um, for flu season, this plant's very edible. I'm sorry, uh, medicinal. This is a hazelnut. So you can see the little nuts uh, growing and, and protected in here. This, this was from the food forest. This was just a wild uh, plant that, that grew up a native and, and we left it again to, to support our insects. This is the persimmon. Uh, persimmons take a very long time to grow. So you just wanna be patient with that. Our American persimmons can get up to like 50 feet tall. Um, so plan accordingly. Um, but they do have lovely edible fruits. Uh, this was ironweed that we grew from seed and uh, propagated in the garden, uh, attracted a lot of uh, you know, insects for us, including butterflies. Uh, this is another image of the ironweed. This was milkweed that we did not plant, um, but we just had the conditions that were right for it. It grew up and it attracted monarchs. Uh, some cherries, you know, that, that we grew in the food forest uh, and figs. This is the last um, picture I have from the food forest. But again, you can see the, the figs here. We have um, just a balance here of edible with our supporting plants. All right, I wanted to share a ton of resources for you. Um, these two books I think would be really wonderful if you are thinking about creating, uh, sorry, that was my timer to make sure that I didn't go over. Um, so, uh, sorry, back to the resources. These two on this side are um, great guides. The first one is specifically a community food forest handbook. Um, this was written by Catherine Bukowski, who visited the Hazelwood food forest, actually wrote a little bit about the, the Hazelwood food forest in her book. Um, and when she visited, she did an inventory of all of the plants and was really impressed by um, the diversity and variety of plants that we had. Um, the Food Forest Handbook is written by um, you know, two sort of local experts, Daryl Fry. Um, he's the one where I learned a lot about the French Creek um, you know, native food forest. And Michelle Zolba uh, was my partner on the Hazelwood Food Forest. So she's you know, shared a lot of what she had learned in, in that book. Um, these are two books that we used in really um, helping to create the food forest. And what I wanted to share is, is you know, uh, a lot of these books aren't going to share, aren't going to focus on the importance of natives. Um, I feel like it's very important to include them. And so I wanted to share some books that will help sort of balance with um, you know growing food for wildlife and that's really the important part of having natives. These are a ton of links. I, I can share this PDF with, with Annie and if you're interested. These are all active links so you can read more um, you know about sort of the history of food forests um, and some other examples and, and these are some books that, that are mentioned in these articles. Um, this is the book by Matt Sonobo Fukuoku um, that I had mentioned, The Natural Way of Farming, sorry, farming. Um, he has some great ideas in that book. Um, so I wanted to make sure I left time for questions and I'm happy to, um, to open it up and answer all of your questions. Um, and Annie, I wasn't sure if you would be able to, um, I don't know, re read the questions that are in the chat box or share those, or if I should, um, Take a look myself. Um, maybe not. Sorry, I just unmuting. Uh, okay. Chat box questions. There was just like a little bit of a chat uh, from Marin talking about wild strawberries, black currants, sunchokes. Yeah. There's no questions in the chat, but if folks have questions. Oh, wait. No, there is more. Mara, did you want to ask your questions? I could read this out loud. Um, the wild strawberries I grew up with uh, were wonderful. The ones I've seen around here are terrible, like wet styrofoam with seeds. Are there other more wonderful ones? Yeah, Marin, growing in my garden,
you know, I don't harvest a ton of them, but I, I do really enjoy them. Um, but I will say there, if you, if you looked, if you tried, um, I'm just trying to think, I was going to suggest Rain Tree Nursery, which is a great nursery for um, all, all sorts of edible plants. They may have a variety of wild strawberries. I don't know. Um, my, my original go-to would have been Oikos tree crops who grew a lot of native edible plants. They are no longer um, in operation. So I can't give you a good, a good resource, um, but, but yeah, that's, I don't, I'm, I don't know. I, the ones that I grow, I, I like them. They taste sort of fragrant, which is a weird thing to say, but um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, were there, were there any other uh, questions about suggestions of plants or how to grow? Hmm. I wanted to say thank you for, um, for presenting all, all of the information that you did. Uh, I'm working on creating a pawpaw grove, um, partnering with uh, Steel City Rowing Club, uh, who has land along the Allegheny River. And you did a lot of the uh, legwork for me. <laughs> you know, all the different, um, we wanted to be sure to have uh, items from each of the layers of the forest in there. So um, by providing all the lists that you did, you did a lot of the work for me. So thank you for making that very easily accessible. That's great. I was, I was hoping to create uh, a resource, you know, that, that could be used um, by you all as well. Um, I do see that, that Marin um, has a link in here um, for the sustainability salons that she hosts um, and looks like the next one, April 9th, that's coming up, um, will be focused on, on food forests. Oh, sorry, on food. It, it, it will be on food and it will include a talk on food forest by John Creasy, who manages the Garfield Community Farm, which is also very permaculture and food foresty. In fact, that's where the uh, local permaculture course is now centered. Yes, and, and Daryl Fry, I don't know if he's still working there, but he was working and um, sort of helping to, to further develop um, Garfield Community Farm. It's a fantastic example. Um, if you wanted to see, you know, a live example of a food forest um, in the city, the, the Garfield Community Forest is really excellent. Um, and, and they, you know, do have some examples of some of the, um, these native plants that I've talked about, as well as other, you know, non-native um, food as well. Um, one more question I see, oh, in terms of having a smaller space, is there anything that um, you would specifically recommend? Um, so what I'm, so I sort of have a, like a, maybe a, like a standard, I'd say city lot. I don't know exactly, you know, how you would uh, describe the size of it. But um, as I said, I love elderberry. Elderberry is one of my most favorite. I have, um, two that I've planted and then one uh, um, that I'm starting to like move some of my elderberry, you know, they, they grow up um, and can really spread from, from their, their sprouts. And I've been able to, to spread that around. Um, and again, I, I love that for um, just all of the benefits that I mentioned, it attracts birds. It's so very medicinal um, and you're making things with that. I have currants that are very, like I said, very prolific, pretty easy to grow. Um, hazelnuts kind of grow in sort of a grove, you know, so you can have kind of a, a few that, that kind of grow together. Um, I mean, I, um, many of the plants that I've mentioned, especially if you, if you have a small area I would look to the smaller trees and the shrubs 
and I would, um, you know, kind of pull from that selection. Uh, another question, are there any other local food forests? Um, so Marin is, is sharing one um, that is being planted in Lawrenceville. Um, that's exciting. There was, there were a lot that were planted, um, I want to say a few years ago. Uh, I know that Daryl Fry was working with um, the fruit tree, let's see they're called the fruit tree planting foundation. Um, had some money to plant food forests in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, there was a planting that happened at a church in Wilkinsburg um, off of Hay Street. I can't give you any more information than that, um, but I know that they they did they did a really nice planting there with with some fruit trees, um, and so the so, you know, so, some examples. So what kind of, I, I missed the first 10 or 15 minutes, um, but uh, what do you look for in deciding where to put a food forest? What, what are, you know, optimum conditions? I mean, I, I feel like it, I feel like it's very, it's variable because again, if we're, if we're using native plants, um, these are plants that are, adapted to our local soils, you know? So um, depending on what sorts of soils you have, um, a lot of these plants will, you know, can, can do, their, do well there. Um, for the most part, if you're sort of starting from scratch, I guess I would be looking for a sunnier location as opposed to um, trying to start in an area that already has a lot of um, large plants or is, is overly shady. Um, you know, especially if you're wanting to grow fruit trees, um, a lot of, you know, any of the, the fruit, the fruits that I've mentioned, um, will produce more fruits, uh, for the most part, the more sun that they have. So even as I mentioned, you know, currants and elderberries are shade tolerant, um, they're going to produce more fruit if they have a little bit more shade. I'm sorry, sun. <laughs> so, so I would, you know, think about an area that, that has um, some sun. The, the most ideal places that I think about for starting food forests is anywhere where there's lots of lawn, you know, so front yards, backyards, um, you know, any, any locations where it's currently being managed as lawn um, can be turned into a food forest. So like going into Shenley Park where the, or Frick Park where there are lots of trees and everything, that's not. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, as, as Marin mentioned, she lives on the edge of Frick Park. So she does have a sort of a background of, of uh, trees and some shade, um, you know, so if you had some property kind of on an edge like that, that, that could be fine. Um, but as I said, more, the more shade you have, the more fruit production um, you'll be able to have. The more and sun. Find the some of shade. these natives, sorry, growing in the forest. I know there's a beautiful stand of pawpaw in uh, Shenley Park, you know, and some, some of these can be, um, you know, sort of wild 